Good evening or morning or whatever. You guys know my spiel. It's kind of routine and it's what I do. Uh, this is Victoria with Dream Dogs. And this is, I just got dinged. This is our Facebook Live that becomes our podcast. And uh, it's been, my well, last week we had one, but it wasn't a super long one, which is fine. We can have a couple short ones. And it was, it was nice. It was, I think, a half hour. Just a real quick on what's going down um, at IACP conference about the traveling to get to conference with two service dogs. And uh, then I did a, uh, a video that I just put up in my Facebook groups, but I didn't get that up on the podcast. And then I finally got um, last week's up yesterday. I want to say yesterday. So it's a little bit late, but that's what happens whenever I'm gone. And then I totally forget about it. Yay. Uh, so this week, what we're going to talk about is my doctor's appointment yesterday, because, you know, me and uh, ICP conference. I have my notes here. I actually, <laughs> during the, the talks, I had Gypsy with me. So I just type them into the notes on my phone because uh, I've got Apple. So it has the notes. So I type the notes up and then I just wrote it into my bullet journal because I do keep a bullet journal. It's pretty nice. And um I do it for six months at a time so then I can put all my notes from dog training and whatever in here. And then all I have to do is remember when it was so I can look it up, <laughs> but it works out really good. I love my bullet journal. Um, and to be able to have a custom calendar really that keeps everything all in one, like how nice is that? Uh, so to start with doctor's appointment, um, I was diagnosed at 19 with neurocardiogenic syncope which is one of the dysautonomia things that can be wrong with you. Uh, and this was after I had passed out at Indian summer up in Milwaukee. I was there with a friend with Karen and we, because we, we liked Indian stuff, right? So we're there, they're doing the, the intro. So you're supposed to stand up. It was warm. It was August or September and, and I'm standing and I'm standing and I don't remember anything. <laughs> and apparently stuck underneath one of the bleachers and somebody sent some kid to go and pop my head back out from underneath the bleachers uh, and they called an ambulance. Now, when my mom heard this, she was very upset because they shouldn't be popping my head out if I passed out like that. You know, what if something was broken or what if they broke something? So I remember coming to in the hospital, probably came to a little bit in the ambulance, um, but I got a nice ambulance ride. I think actually, I think that was my first and only ambulance ride um, to a hospital in Milwaukee. Um, they called my parents. This was, I was 19. This was over 20 years ago. Uh, it was before everyone had cell phones, right? So we couldn't just, Karen couldn't just call up and say, hey, something happened. So the, um, I guess the ambulance people called up. So mom and dad were about an hour away or so. And that had to be scary. So they came out uh, you know, Karen was waiting at the hospital with me. She was freaked out. You know, there goes our fun day. Uh, they, I believe they did an MRI and a CAT scan, I want to say, because it looks like a seizure. If you ever see me do it, it looks like a seizure. It's not. Uh, and then they referred me to a cardiologist in Waukesha, which is where we lived at the time, at the hospital there. And so I saw him and he's the one who ordered the tilt table test who ended up diagnosing me as a neurocardiogenic syncope. He wanted to try me on Norpace. So I went on Norpace at 19. <laughs> that was fun. Uh, they had to put me in a hospital to get it started just so they could monitor me because I guess it can be pretty weird stuff. Um, so I was in college at the time. So I had my college homework and I was working on college homework the weekend I was in the hospital. I had friends come and visit me in the hospital. I'm like, dude, I'm fine. They're just starting me on meds and they need to keep me under observation. Uh, but we we did that. Then he did another tilt table test before they checked me out of the hospital. And I came really, 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 really close, but I fought it and I didn't actually pass out. But I had all the pre syncopal things. It was terrible. So he put me on either Zoloft or Paxil along with the Norpace, which again, over 20 years ago, no doctor had heard of. So it was very, why are you on Zoloft? Well, not for that reason. It's because it's supposed to work, you know, good with the Norpace for this issue. No, I, I know why you're on Zoloft or Paxil. I'm like, no, they're not happy pills for me. It's, and I was actually looking up yesterday, I was getting some information on some of the different meds they use for it and why, um, why that would work. So anyway, I 
That was in Wisconsin. I uh, got pregnant and we moved to Kentucky. Rich got a job transfer down there to Kentucky and went down to Kentucky and needed to find an OBGYN. I was a little worried about passing out on the delivery table. So I talked with, a, I believe, an electrophysiologist and a cardiologist, both, along with the OBGYN, and everyone agreed <laughs> C-section would be the best. Um, I couldn't be on meds because <laughs> I was pregnant. And I spent most of that summer, because Luke is an August baby, I spent most of the summer at my parents. They live four hours away in West Virginia. Uh, and they had an in-ground pool. And mom, you know, she she didn't have a job. She just, her job was taking care of the house and my sister and my brother and my dad, my dad worked from home. So there was always somebody with me in ground pool to keep cool. They had central air. We just had a window unit in the rental that we had. Um, so we, the doctor okayed that at four hours away. Um, now you want to know if I'm part, my aunt stopped talking to me at this time because I couldn't make it four more hours away, which would have been eight total for my doctor to go to my cousin's wedding. And I really wanted to go because it would have been really fun to go. But doctor had explicit instructions that, no, you cannot. I'm like, please, my parents will be there. No, I don't care. Four hours is stretching it, Vic. So I wasn't able to go to my cousin's wedding. And for that, my aunt never talked to me again. Super fun family, right? Um, no meds after. Or I think they tried a meds afterwards, but, you know, nothing worked out. Moved to Maryland and saw a cardiologist there. Cardiologist there thought I was faking it. So he sent me over to John Hopkins. John Hopkins says, Haha, you're not faking it. The doctor's nuts. Uh, and you have it pretty severe. And I'm like, I know. So we talked then nomads. Now during this time, like one of the doctors had mentioned a pacemaker and I said, I'm early twenties, mid twenties. I'm not getting a pacemaker. Thank you. Or even 19. I don't remember when the pacemaker was introduced, but I'm like, I'm not getting a pacemaker. Thank you. Tried out a couple different types of meds. Nothing worked. So I've been off meds since for 18 years since Luke's been born. Uh, right. Terry family. Ugh. Uh, so I haven't been on meds and I've just been kind of winging it. I'm supposed to um, put my feet up when I'm dizzy. I'm supposed to sit or lie down. I'm supposed to drink a lot of fluids, which is why I usually have my travel mug with ice and water. I drink a few of these every day. Uh, I'm supposed to up my salt intake. So I generous with the salt that I put on food. Um, I have compression hose. Like nothing works though. And this summer has just been brutal. And I've commented, I mentioned this, like the summer has just been so bad. Um, but even before then, as much as I love going to Disney, and if you look back on Facebook or on Instagram, I go to Disney and Universal a lot. But I couldn't do what I want to do there. I've heard people going and hitting two, three, four parks in a day. There's no way I could ever do that. I could barely do one park in a day. For example, last year, on my birthday, we went to Epcot because that's Luke's favorite. And so we figured we'd do Epcot. Uh, we get there. I start feeling so terrible, but I don't want to go there too. And I had an arrow. So they went to the back because Luke loves Japan uh, because of the big store at Japan there. And I stayed in the front right behind the big ball uh, by the, if you're familiar, the, um, the Electric Umbrella restaurant. There's like, what is that? Innovations East or West or whatever. Um, so I stayed over there. I laid down. I had him down and I put my legs up on top of him, you know, the under the legs to to raise him to get the blood back up to the head. I had so many people come by, ask if I was okay. I'm like, I'm, I'm fine. I'll be good. Um, just trying to feel a semblance of normal. And that was last year. So it's not like it's just been this summer. But here's the good news. I find, because every now and then I'll look for more info. But again, I've been living with this my whole life. I remember passing out. Before we moved out of Pennsylvania, we moved when I was 10. So before we moved out of Pennsylvania, I remember passing out in the bathroom as a kid. And I remember getting up from the floor thinking, I must have been tired to fall asleep while I'm in the bathroom. Yeah. And who knows what other times I had passed out that I just didn't realize. I just thought I was really tired and needed a nap. And that's not what it was. But we, um, you know, so it's something I've dealt with my whole life. I passed out in Connecticut. So that's between the ages of 10 and 13. I passed out in the, in the shower. So after that, I was not allowed to have a shower with the door closed. It had to be open at least a little bit. 
um, just in case they, I needed, in case I passed out, in case, you know, they heard a thump, you know, they can get in. I couldn't lock the door of the bathroom because what if, um, you know, and it was, it's just something I've always lived with. I'm early forties now. Uh, and, and it's something that I've always, I get out of bed slow. I stand up slow because the blood pulse pressure stuff happens. Um, you know, I keep a washcloth by the bathroom, you know, by, by the sink so I can do a cold, wet washcloth, which is my mom's remedy for everything. That and a cup of hot tea. Uh, you know, it's just, it's something I've always lived with. But I got on um, this Autonomia International, the Florida support group on Facebook. And that had, uh, everyone talks about this Dr. Trevino in Clearwater. Well, Clearwater is like less than two hours from me to get to his place. It was like an hour 45. Yeah. So we had the appointment yesterday. We had scheduled it a few weeks ago, but then we were gone for conference. So we went to uh, to Dr. Trevino. Rich and I drove down yesterday. We left at eight. We didn't get home till three. We did stop for lunch and we stopped at Tractor Supply because, you know, Rich. Um, we actually, the goats were escaping and we need something for the fence. So went there. He had five things to get going. A uh, new diagnosis. Uh, I thought I was just clumsy and that people weren't meant to be ever, well, women maybe weren't meant to be ever six foot tall. And that's why I have all these joint issues. No, it turns out there's a better reason for that. And it's going to mangle the pronunciation, Erlodanlos syndrome. Um, both wrists, I have to sleep with wrist braces on at night or my fingers will go numb. On my shoulder, I just woke up and it was bad. I don't know what I did. And that was bad for a year. And it gives me problems. And it's my dog walking shoulder. It's my left shoulder. Um, elbows, had problems with that. Both knees now, my hip, both ankles. Like all my joints, I've had issues with at some point, And some of them are recurring and some of them aren't. So like I said, I thought I was just accident prone. You know, I thought, thank goodness I didn't play basketball in college or professionally because I would have really messed myself up there. But anyway, um, this is the, what the doctor said to do is I have to follow a low FODMAP diet, which means there's weird things I can eat and weird things I can't eat. Like zucchini is okay, but yellow squash is not okay. Um, and see if that will help with the uh, irritable bowel. For the syncope in the irritable bowel, I'm getting meds. So Rich is picking those up for me tonight. Um, I'm supposed to, he, I have an exercise program, which, you know, we had been doing the gym and I haven't because I've been so bad lately. Um, so I have my exercise program to do. This counts, you know, how active I am, my Apple Watch here, and it counts the heart rate and it's the EKG. So yay. So I, I do have that to help. I'm supposed to get compression, basically spanks from knees to like ribs. Um, but that's going to be the last thing I do because... I get hot and I want to rip things off. Um, so I don't know how good that'll be. And the compression isn't always my friend. I'm supposed to up my salt um, to four grams a day. Um, so that's, I think, two of the electrolyte powders that I have. Um, or I have to look up because I haven't written down so many teaspoons or tablespoons. And one of the comments was just get a baggie of salt and add it to your food and your drink. Like, that sounds gross. Uh, so the meds, the compression, the salt, the exercise, crap, there's something else. There's five of them. I wrote it down and I don't have that paper right here. But um, but yeah, so that and then we're going to see where I'm at in a month. So hopefully we'll get some improvement um, because it stinks. I'm supposed to sit up right more, not put my feet up as much and not lay down unless I'm sleeping or napping. So I said, okay, we'll try this and see. Terry says, I can't imagine wearing Spanx in this hot and humid climate. Yeah. And um, I get stomach aches, hence the irritable bowel. And can you imagine whenever you really have to go and you have to get those Spanx off of you as fast as possible and they're hot and sweating and sticking to you? <laughs> yeah, that's all I like. I said, that'll be the lot. Um, but it was interesting. Um, some things, like I was told that the compression hose, the socks up to your knees, that's what I needed. And then he's saying, no, it's the thighs and stomach that you need to compress. So that was new information. Um, I knew, uh, I didn't know about the diet. That's new. Um, it, it's not for the syncope technically, but still. Um, the, the meds, I'm trying a new med that I didn't know about. 
do they come with zippers, right, Terry? That's that's what we need is zippers and like a button to make it magically disappear. Um, so I'm glad I got the exercises. He said to do, what did he say? Recumbent bike, rowing or kicking or swimming in a pool. He says to keep on a horizontal plane as much as possible. And it could explain why during some of these, whenever, especially we go too long, I'm just like, I just can't do this anymore and I've got to go. It's because apparently just sitting upright at a table like this, it's hard and hard. And that, guess what? That's why I was bad at conference last week. Because so I was like, you know, usually a 20, 30 minute nap and I'm good. And some days I don't even need a nap. And then some days I'm like, holy cow, just like feel like a herd of elephants run me over. And last week at conference, the only time I had my feet up was whenever I was lying down in bed. You know, they didn't have recliner chairs. And uh, it depends, maybe necessary. <laughs> totally, Terry. Um, they didn't have recliner chairs. So, you know, it was a bunch of me sitting upright, which would explain why I wasn't feeling good. I didn't sit on the floor, which I should have. I should have just sat on the floor, laid down on the floor. But the rooms, <laughs> there were so many people that were there. It was so awesome. So there wasn't like a ton of open space to just, you know, kick back and relax. But that would explain why I felt so cruddy during that time, which is terrible. I don't like that. I don't like to feel cruddy. Um, but conference was freaking amazing. I love going to conference. This was our, I want to say, sixth year. Oh, so I'll keep you updated on the medical stuff, too, with how it's going. And I need you guys to help keep me going, too, because they want you to go to the gym, well, physical exercise three days a week and the weights twice a week. So like I said, Rich and I have been to the gym. He's up there now without me. <laughs> Cause I said, that's the only time we're gonna be able to do it today. Cause I've got this, but uh, I, mean, I need you guys to keep me on that and make sure that it's going good. And then I need to do up a chart so I can write it down. Um, and I started that yesterday, little, um, not Excel, a numbers spreadsheet. So I know, cause I didn't know, like, what do you do? Just like go to the gym and do as much as you can. No, it's supposed to be two reps of 10 for these different things. And whenever you can do the second rep of 10, then you up the weight or you add a third rep of 10. Cause one of them said two, which is when he gave me and I found another one online and it said to go three reps of 10. And then whenever you can do those easily, just up your weight and just keep up in your weight. And I'm like, Oh, that's interesting. I never knew that. Um, so conference, we had over 500 people. I think it was 525 people and 60 dogs. So this is the only dog conference that is dog friendly. Okay. I had gone to an APDT one years ago, six, seven, eight, maybe eight or nine years ago. And it, there were two service dogs there and they were both like service dogs, really? Um, but there were no, no, um, no pet dogs. And this one had, had 60 dogs. So how amazing is that? Plus the hotel was pet friendly. So there are other dogs at the hotel that weren't part of our group, but still. Oh, here, Melissa says, I'll be your long distance gym buddy. I need to start going back Monday, three days a week. Perfect, Melissa. I like it. We'll do it. Um, so conference, I usually, they, they usually have four speakers a day. And usually I have to miss one of them because again, I need that nap in the afternoon. So there was a nice chunk of time for lunch. And then they did something called paper plate recalls. That was something that Dick Russell had done. So they started doing that. I want to say this was the third year of doing paper plate recalls um, as a competition there. Um, I don't compete in that, but it's, it was fun to watch. I got to watch it today or not today, this time. Um, and, and so I'm like, well, I'll just go back and sleep. And I slept for like I said, an hour and a half because I was just, my body was just done. Um, here, Terry says, I cannot imagine a dog trainer conference that doesn't allow dogs. So APDT, we, there were a couple of speakers who were members and, and kind of had honcho -y types in APDT. And I guess they were both impressed by how good the, the dogs were, our dogs were, which of course they're good or they wouldn't come, you know, um, did Todd wear his wig? Yes, he did. And he had a nice, um, zoot suit type of thing going. And he has his nice little voice for being his announcer. Yeah, it was super. And um, Jason Vasconi was the uh, the referee. So he had his referee shirt on. It was fun. And like I said, I never, I haven't got to see it. Luke and Rich went up and watched it. Uh, so Luke went, Rich went, I went, Gypsy went, and then Karen and Holstein went. So we had six of us. We flew out last, well, not last Friday, but we flew out Friday night. We got there. We were eating at Applebee's. We left Applebee's. Uh, we got to Applebee's at like noon, uh, midnight, and we left at one. 
So I think we landed around 10 o'clock or so in Denver. We had a rental car, so we ate at Applebee's, and then we went to the hotel and checked in around 2 in the morning. Conference started Sunday, and that was like Friday night, Saturday morning. So we had Saturday to just kind of relax. It uh, turns out the hotel, this is pretty cool. It was a nice hotel. I liked it. I wouldn't mind going back there. Uh, the hotel, everyone was super. Um, they have a week rate. So seven days for 700. So that's what Karen and I did. Um, and then they have something for us there. We have like a special lounge. So she did her laundry before we left, which was nice. So she didn't have to bring a suitcase full of dirty clothes home. And uh, if you put, because they have a couple restaurants there along with room service. So if you put like $100 into your account, they would match the $100. So you'd have $200 in your account. So that's what we both did. And, uh, you know, hung out, met up with friends, you know, talked with people on on um, Saturday. So that was super. Sunday, um, Sunday it started. And like I said, I missed, I missed half. And I, I was so upset that I had to miss half. But like I was just, I was more than done. And I had to go back to the room and I had to sleep. And I just, I, I couldn't. So, um, so like I said, I felt, I felt terrible about it, but, um, did a uh, nose work, uh, with Barbara DeGroote and it was funny. She started by saying, cause Barbara's so there, she's so lovely. I love her. Um, she said that her experience with nose work, this might be boring for you, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I'm like a little experienced here. You know, I've done quite a bit between tracking and nose work and everything else. But of course I stay because I love Barbara and it was just, she's such an amazing presenter. If you have the opportunity to see Barbara DeGroote, I highly recommend it. She's super and she does it a little bit different. And that's the nice thing is everybody does it a little bit different than somebody else. Uh, so it was neat. She had a video of hamsters or gerbils that she was sent training. Like how cool is that? Uh, and she had, um, what you do gunpowder on Q-tips. And that's what she was having the dogs do. Um, and she also had a something to add to the temperament test to work on tracking. So that temperament test that you do at 49 days old, that Volhard puppy test, what she says is take a smear of peanut butter on the ground and see if the dog stays on track. Right? How neat is that? I never even thought of that. And that's a great addition to a temperament test, especially whenever you're dealing with any sort of nose work or tracking. And it's peanut butter, so it's pretty, you know, you can pretty much smell it. Uh, Dr. Rob spoke that night, um, R-O-B-B. -B. Um, she, he was fantastic. Oh my gosh. I am so glad I got to hear Dr. Rob, um, what he was saying, and this is amazing guys, you need to check him out. It's protect. I want to say protect the pets.com. Do I have it written down here? Um, I think it's protect the pets. Check his website. Let me pull it up here and see protect the pets it might be a dot org protect the pets so you guys need to check out protect the pets.com because he his story was just amazing he i think he only spoke for an hour here i'll stick it can i stick it in here comments no apparently uh, oh right here so there, I'm going to stick it in here for you guys. Pull it up in a new window so you don't miss me. Uh, but protectthepets.com. Um, what he was saying is the Lyme vaccine doesn't work. Um, you can, let's see, Lepto, he said Lepto would have to be given every three months for it to work. And that's something that if you catch it early, it's easy to treat with amoxicillin. And dogs can have really bad reactions to the Lepto vaccine. So don't do Lepto, don't do Lyme. Um, rabies, he said, if you can do it at six months of age or older, it's better. If you can do it at a year, that would be even better. And then afterwards, tighter for it. The rabies vaccine can turn a dog aggressive or give it cancer. It's the worst vaccine. And after that, lepto is the second worst vaccine. So you want to, how do you do it? You ask if your vet doesn't tighter or if your vet charges like $300 to tighter, what you do is you have your vet draw. No, I'm not a vet. <laughs> this is just my notes from conference. Um, have your vet draw and spin the blood, and then you can send it into test, and you can get a rabies titer certificate. Uh, his website says how to open your diagnosis account at Kansas State uh, for the titer test. And it's around $30 for the rabies and $45 for the rabies distemper and parvo. So when your vet wants you to come in. Now, we had a vet in Gainesville who wanted us to come in twice a year for our annual vaccines. I'm going to let that sink in. 
Twice a year, he wanted to come in for our annual vaccines. It's twice a year he wanted us to have the rabies, distemper, parvo, um, abortatella, I'm sure with the dog flu one now, and rabies. Because he, uh, we had a transient dog population in Gainesville because of the homeless people who had dogs and all the college kids who bring up, brought their dogs. So that's what, what they were saying. Uh, what this doctor was saying, now guess what happened about Five years later, this dog built a massive, amazing, beautiful, brand new vet building. Yeah, he built that. I wonder how he paid for that. Huh. Go figure. Anyway, so you want to do it. Um, Django got his at three months old. I wish I could have waited, but I was flying with them. Maybe I shouldn't have. You know, I can't go back in the past. You guys can't go back in the past. But you know what we can do is when he goes in at a year old, instead of getting him vaccines, get the blood drawn, have it spin, and do the titer testing if your vet doesn't do it. If you do vaccines, especially his puppies, he had his puppy thing, so get ready to take notes. You do one vaccine per visit, and you have a lower volume for smaller pets, and he has the chart on his website for that as well. Because why should a Great Dane get the same amount of vaccine as a chihuahua? Right? It doesn't make sense, does it? Skip the flu vaccine. Um, totally skip the flu vaccine. Now, I, I, he said about Bordetella, and then I don't about Bordetella. So we do Bordetella because it's in my home, you know, and um, it's like the flu shot, which I'm probably going to get this year. Parvo is important. Um, you get a single reduced dose. What he recommends is one single reduced dose at 12 weeks old. Distemper at 14 weeks old with the reduced dose. And then at six months old, tighter Parvo. Titer for Parvo, and then do the rabies vaccine. So that's what he recommends. Now, some areas, like Florida, Parvo actually is a thing that happens. So you do have to watch that. So check his website. He says the adenovirus and hepatitis aren't in the USA. Now, the DHLPP that might be on yours, he says the A and the H. DHLPP, why well, I didn't say H. But um, they aren't even in the U.S., so you can get a single vaccine. You can get a single vaccine of Parvo and a single vaccine of distemper. And if your vet doesn't do it, talk to him and he will send you a single vaccine. He will sell it to you if your vet doesn't carry it. Or if your vet says, well, I have to order 10 of them at $30 a vaccine. So you have to pay $300 if you want a single thing. Um, Dr. Rob will send it to you. And then retitle every three years. So whenever they're due to go back, I don't know when that is. Um, Gypsy had her second set of shots, just tighter them. And, and they'll, there's talk about like, well, if they have so many tighter levels, this is good or that's good. Um, what he said, and I love this and I wrote it down is tighter is like being pregnant. You are pregnant or you're not pregnant. So there's no, it doesn't matter how many antibodies of tighter you have, you're tightered or you're not tightered. Okay. So I thought that was, that was really, really, really interesting. Cause I know the vets like to push the lepto in the line. Um, and that dog flu vaccine, holy cow. And like I said, it is something like it happened down here. But if the vaccine doesn't work or if it has too many harmful side effects, how can you do that? So Michelle asked, then why do vets recommend the rabies vaccine? Because rabies is a real thing that can cross species. So I have uh, one of my clients, they had got a puppy from somebody and the puppy ended up having rabies. And so they all had to get the rabies vaccine because they were there, or the rabies, not the vaccine, the, the rabies, like the seven shots in the stomach, it was not fun. So it can cross that species barrier where a lot of things like Bordetella can't, I don't think, cross the species barrier. So you need to have the rabies vaccine. Now, when we first moved here, I don't know how many years ago it was, probably around 15, 16 years ago, we moved to Florida and I joined up with the dog club. They were talking about a seven year rabies study to see the efficiency of the effectiveness of the rabies vaccine seven years later. Okay. Um, they were finding that, yeah, it's good for seven years. How many years, how many, how often do you have to vaccinate? You have to vaccinate every, you know, the first one's usually a year. Some states have it that they only accept the year ones. Uh, Florida, you can do it every three years after that initial one. But again, if you have the tighter, you should be good to go. And he'll even do a tighter certificate for you. Uh, and here Terry says, many pharmaceuticals push it. Yeah. Michelle says, I might vaccinated my dogs and they were fine. Sometimes we vaccinate and they're fine and sometimes they aren't. So I also talked to another friend who uh, did her, I'm going to say four to five year old German Shepherd. And he had a reaction from the rabies vaccine. 
so it does happen. Uh, it's not something that I can not have that, guys. It's not something I'm going to have happen bad to my dogs, but I'm also, I need my dogs to be fully immunized. So Dr. Rob, R-O-B-B, check him out. It was super awesome. Uh, and, and support that Protect the Pets um, website of his. Because it has to, if you're not in it for the pets, you're not in it for the right reasons, right? Uh, Terry says, I made the mistake of going to an expensive vet for titers. Rabies need to be 0.5 and Mavericks was 2.5. So, yeah. Yeah, because that always confused me. There's a couple things that they talked about that cleared things up quite a bit. Like this, like what's the best schedule? Um, so usually they get a set of shots right before they go home from the breeders. And then like two weeks later or a month later and then like another month later. So like it's say eight weeks, not eight months, two months old. Oh my gosh, Vicky, two months old, three months old, four months old is the final one with the rabies. So whenever we did gypsy, we made sure like, I'll be back in a month. Thank you. You know, I'll be back in three weeks for her next shot, you know, to separate out the distempo or parvo shot from the rabies, but to find out that I could do the individual, that's even better. So that's what our next ones we'll have. Uh, so that was fantastic. Um, Terry also asked if I heard Tara speak in legal issues with dogs. I did not. That is one I had to miss. Um, she's probably as tall as you, right? I heard it was really good. I want to say Rich and Luke went to that one and really enjoyed it. Um, Kong, I went to him the next day. Uh, here, Terry says, I know several owners with dogs that develop autoimmune from over-vaccinating. One was exempt from rabies because another show shot would have killed her. Well, that's, so it's only supposed to be administered to healthy dogs, you know? And he was saying about, you know, uh, a, a client who had a dog who was having seizures and having issues. And what did they do? They vaccinated him with the rabies, which caused everything to just escalate even more. You know, the dog is sick and sick dog shouldn't be getting the vaccines like that anyway. Like Zoe's not getting any more vaccines um, because she's like 14 and she's really bad off right now. So Zoe's not getting any more vaccines. Um, so Kong, now I had heard Mark Hines from Kong. He's, so if you don't know, at a conference, there is a cables and he brings boxes upon boxes of bomb boxes of Kong stuff. And it's cash only. And so we usually fill up. And it's super awesome. And uh, I love trying all their different things. I usually grab some extras. Um, this year I bought a lot of Wabas because I like Wabas. And you think you buy a lot and you go back to your room, you're like, this isn't near enough. It's kind of like Christmas. Um, except he runs out every year. <laughs> uh, he runs out the first year, he didn't run out. And then every year since then, he's, he's run out of toys and stuff. So he talked about play and using Kong. So one of the things he said was you can stop it or you can toss it and get the dog to play. Um, Dr. Stuart Brown um, did a YouTube. You can search him up, Dr. Stuart Brown, 26 video, minute video on play. Uh, he said to be proactive, not reactive. You can use it to promote calm. You can use toys and Kong stuff to reduce fear and anxiety and stress. Um, if you use a mat, have them go to the mat so you don't get any food on your floor, because floor, especially if you stuff a Kong. Uh, you can let the dog figure it out or you can help them. Um, but don't say he doesn't like it, because I do hear that. Well, my dog just doesn't like that. But you give him the chance to, to get to use it, to get to like it. Not always. Uh, he was saying uh, how to use some of the different toys. So I'm super stoked about that. And then candy is a destructive chewer. It's called scissoring. Which will just <laughs> and she'll, like, destroy a toy pretty easy. So he gave us some tips and then I talked to him about it afterwards. I got some tips on how to get her to um, to play better. So that's what we've been working on with her and I need to get that actually on video so I can share it with, with you guys, share it in the online course um, because she's not the only one who, who plays bad with toys. I guess scissoring and then picking are like the two bad habits um, that doesn't promote calm and you want to be able to promote calm um, whenever you're playing with your dog as well. Uh, Larry Crone was there. Um, one of the things he said is he creates the dog at night until they're a year old, and then he creates them when he leaves the house until they're two years old. So I wrote those down. His, um, He talked, and then he did um, Q&A. So I did the first day, and Rich did the second day, and it was different, which was pretty cool, um, you know, that it's not the same thing. Um, Monica uh, Davis was there. Uh, what can? Oh, hold on. Michelle has a question. What can I put in a Kong? She doesn't like peanut butter. Anything. 
So you can, if your dog's on raw food, you can use that. If your dog is on kibble, you can take the kibble in a regular bowl and soak it when it's mush, pack it in there and have them eat it from there. Uh, you can take any of your leftovers. Like sometimes I'll just pop a pizza crust in the Kong toy and let them play with that to get the pizza crust out. Gypsy loves bananas. So you know when bananas are bad and your choice is banana bread or throw them away? Nope, you break them in half. Well, you shove them in a Kong, break it in half because half fits in one of my Kongs. Shove it in another Kong, either freeze it or give it to two dogs. So bananas, you can, if you have like cottage cheese or cream cheese or yogurt, or, you know, noodles. I don't do spaghetti noodles um, with sauce, with the red sauce. I'll do just like plain noodles. I will do a pack it up with leftovers that are dog safe, uh, you know, and, and give it to them that way. Uh, so, so really the sky's limit. Michelle, you could probably look on Pinterest for Kong stuffing ideas. I know they have like different recipes and stuff. Um, there's cheese, what is it? Cheese whiz, right? Like cheese goop that you can put in it. Um, there's... I like bananas. They're my favorite, like just because they're so easy and they're like Kong and shaped. <laughs> so you just shove it in and break it off. Um, but really, like I said, any any leftover type of things. Um, there's biscuits that look like Kong that you can shove in there. <laughs> Rich said the other day he picks up a Kong. He goes, there's something in here. And he goes, what's there a cookie in here for? That's a dog cookie. Um, in the Kongs, they have the pink and the blue. And those are for boys and girl puppies, right? The purple one is also a soft one. So those are the softest Kongs. The red one is the normal one, and the black one is the extreme Kong. So if you have a rough chewer, you might want to try the black one. But don't leave them unsupervised until you're sure your dog's not going to destroy it because you don't want them to destroy it. I love Kong toys. They're my absolute favorite brand. That and BarkBox. That's pretty much all I buy. And some Chuck It stuff, too. Um, I'll do some tugs. But I love Kong stuff. And I brought – this was the year of the Wubbas. I bought a bunch of Wubbas, some new food dispensing toys. Um, it's super – but I love being able to stuff food in it. Oh, canned food. You know, you can get a can of dog food and mix it up with some of the leftovers or just put it in there normally. If you mix it up, if you mix up anything, say you mix up like yogurt and cottage cheese and some, some canned food and like whatever else you have, some smooshed bananas, some apple chunks. What you can do is put it in a gallon size or a quart size Ziploc baggie and squeeze the extra air out and squeeze the top, cut the corner so it's like an icing bag and just pipe it in. It's much easier to fill up that way than to try to like spoon it in. And it's much less work, much less mess. So that's good on both accounts, right? Uh, but yeah, we do a lot with Kong. And then I do have a couple of videos, Michelle, on our YouTube channel, on Dream Dogs on YouTube channel, on how to stuff a Kong. So we, we go through quite a bit there. And they're both on the online course too. And I believe I have them both set up as free previews on the online course. So you can, you know, check it out and watch them for free because we do have them up on YouTube. Um, so Larry and then grooming with Monica, I had done hers a couple years ago and I loved it so much. Luke loved it. This was Luke's favorite when he saw it initially. Um, so we, I did Monica's, uh, she was saying about the Ferminator stuff, how they have the Ferminator shampoo and sprays and stuff that's supposed to help and how excited they were when it first came out. And then it turns out all I did was put a coating on the dog's coat and it was gross. Uh, but, you know, talked and then they work dogs because I came in just a couple minutes late and sat in the back and she says, you know, Vicky, do you have Gypsy with you? And I said, yeah. She goes, can we use her? And I said, yeah. Well, they only had, they had three grooming stands and two dogs were on them the whole time. And then the other one switched with a couple dogs, but Gypsy didn't get her turn. Uh, I didn't even brush her that morning because I was like, we're going to go up and maybe you get professionally groomed. Um, and then Karen had a question, uh, you know, for Monica, which was great. Uh, I have something that my friend Tracy mentioned to Monica who said about it you know, the first day and then I went the second day. So um, here's a tip. If you are unsure about cutting your nails, this is a trip from Tracy Adkins. She's outside Houston. And she's an excellent dog trainer. I'm actually going to have her on the pod for the next week or so. Uh, and what it is, is you take a toothpick, okay, a toothpick, a wooden toothpick, and you draw with uh, a light sharpie, you draw some lines. Doo, 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 doo. Then you get your nail trimmers and you practice lining it up and cutting, lining it up and cutting, lining it up and cutting. So you gain your confidence that way. And whenever it's time to practice on your, to actually do on your dog, you're not as nervous. 
That's a pretty cool tip, right? That's all to Tracy. Now, when you tell friends about this, you have to tell them it's from Tracy in Texas. And she's amazing, and I love her. Uh, there was an amazing doctor vet there. Um, and she talked about cannabis. And I had no idea anything about this. Colorado is a legal state. Uh, <coughs> but we uh, we didn't try any while we were there. Just the cannabis oil or the CBD. So here, this. do you guys want to know what the difference is between cannabis and not? Uh, because I had no idea. No idea anything about this. Hemp is less than 0.3% THC. And marijuana is more than 0.3% THC. So that's the difference between hemp and marijuana. Is 0.3% THC less is hemp, more is marijuana. So THC is marijuana-based, and you get it through a dispensary. It's used to treat severe inflammation, cancer treatment, and uncontrolled pain. Now, the CBD is hemp-based, which is that less than 0.3%, and you get that over the counter. So we have one, it turns out one of my clients owns it, which is pretty cool. Uh, and so we've been using theirs. Um, Luke's been using the edibles and we've got the drops for Zoe. And then I've tried the drops. I don't care for it. I, I do have a pain cream rub that I really do like though. So CBD is hemp based. You use that for chronic disease, for behavior disorders, for immune deficiency and stress and for focus. So she was saying the chronic disease would be like say migraines, inflammatory bowel disease, mood disorders, and what it does is it balances the endocannabinoid system. It doesn't change your body, but allows it to balance. So I thought that was really interesting. And this one is going to be available. I highly recommend it whenever it does come up. Um, I think Dr. Robs might be available in this one. I highly, highly, highly recommend it. Um, if you weren't able to do it, what they're going to do is sell them individually um, through canine professionals. I want to say .com is the website. Again, I will pull that up. I never remember if it's a .com or .org. So let's try it and see. Uh, canineprofessionals.com. Yes, canineprofessionals.com is the IACP one. Um, that is our site. If you guys want to go check that out, that would be fantastic. It's canineprofessionals.com, and I will um, add it down here. Because I have to scroll to the bottom here to add. Uh, I highly recommend it, even if you're like, I'm not a dog pro. Uh, we have an affiliate membership for anyone who just wants to be part of something bigger, promote awesome trainers, and um, to join. The, the woman, Cindy, who does our, who plans everything, who is the conference coordinator, she's flipping amazing. She's not a dog trainer. She just loves what we do, and she wants to support us. The treasurer for the group, also not a dog trainer. He's a professional accountant. That's what he does. I told him that Hope Service Dogs is now 501c3 because we had talked about it last year about doing it. He he said right away, if there's anything that I need, please just contact him. It is no problem. You know, uh, so I thought that was super. Like, the organization is, is really amazing. And if you're debating about joining or not, if you're a dog pro, do it. If you're not a dog pro, do it. Uh, they're, they're just, they're phenomenal. I've been a professional member for years, Rich started as an associate, I want to say, and he now is a professional. Luke started as an affiliate, and he's now an associate. So it's affiliate, associate, and then professional. And associate is less than five years experience, and professional is more than five years experience. And then affiliate is just someone who wants to support it. So like I said, that's what Luke did for the longest time. Um, Grisha Stewart was there. She talked about BAT 2.0. Um, and what I really liked about hers is she made a point to talk about how to properly handle the leash, how to do leash work well, um, and, and what you can do to better your leash work. Now, I did tracking. I've done leash work stuff before, and it's really great because not a lot of people, some people get too tool-focused and not leash work-focused. So it was really great how well she talked about, you know, having good leash work. I thought that was super. Um uh, Dr. Ian Dunbar was there. I didn't catch his. Like I said, there th those are who I I heard. Anyone else? I don't think I heard because I think I took notes on everybody. Because uh, I just some of, twice <coughs> I was in the uh, 
big bond stuff talking or just relaxing instead of going back to the room. Most times I was napping. Um, sometimes like there was at least three of them too, I think where I was between the exhibit hall or just talking to people. So that's part of why I go to is networking with people. I'm seeing friends that I don't see very often because uh, you kind of do your own thing and you're in your own world and you just, you just kind of do it, especially since I have Rich and Karen and Autumn and Luke. I don't feel like I'm isolated. Like I have people I can talk to about training and we can bounce ideas off of. And some people don't have that. And that's why the ISCP is amazing. Deb said CBD doesn't give you a high, but the THC uh, <clears throat> works with MS, spasticity, and epilepsy. I'm not a dog pro and joined as an affiliate. Deb, that's awesome. I'm really happy to hear that. <sighs> I didn't know you had. That's super. I'm proud of you. Good girl. And I'm not getting teary-eyed. <laughs> um, Deb joined ISCP. You guys love me. Um, Martin Dealey uh, was one of the founders of ISCP. He's been executive director for years. And our very first conference, I think this was number six that we just did. Our very first conference was in Alexandria, Virginia, or as I refer to it, the DC one. So he's right outside of DC and Luke won a scholarship to go. So Mar it was Martin's dad's scholarship and he welcomed us with open arms. He could not have been any nicer. Uh, I went down him and um, Mark Goldberg were doing a workshop again, years and years and years ago. And I went down there and they're like, why are you here? And I hadn't met them in person yet. And I'm like, well, because you're close and it's both of you together. And they're like, yeah, but you know this. So I thought that was pretty cool too. Um, you know, but that was my first introduction to, to meeting Martin in person. I had emailed him a few times because I was going to go one of the last IACP uh, conferences was in Hutto in Texas. And I was going to go and I messaged him. I said, is it air conditioned? And he said, half of it is. I said, I can't go. It was in the summer and it was the heat. I, I can't handle that. So the Alexandria, Virginia one is one of the ones whenever they first started getting out of how to for sure for real seas and you know going around the country so i think there were about 300 went to that one and so it was there st louis so alexandria virginia st louis missouri um then it was the california one and then st louis again and then Clearwater, and then colorado so that was number six for us and it's grown from 300 people to 525 people at conference so that's pretty cool and then next year is in Clearwater again. So I'm very excited about that. The location is amazing. It is right on the beach. They have a dog park, which is super. Uh, we were actually exhibitors last year, so I don't know if we'll do exhibiting again this year. Again, it's nice because I have a place where people can come and find me and say, hey, um, because I did, I do have my Professional Woman Dog Trainers Facebook group, which apparently is known as the, oh yeah, that Chick Trainers group. So we're the Chick Trainers group. Um, we, you know, we met some of the people up. Um, we got a lot of new members joining. Uh, so if you're a female professional dog person, you don't have to be a dog trainer, but if a female professional dog person and you want to join it, um, there's like three questions to answer. They're super easy questions. Uh, it's not like, what is the meaning of life? But it's the professional woman dog trainers group. And if you're a vet or a groomer or a dog walker or boarding or daycare, and, but you're a professional, like, join it. It's super. It's a great group. Um, and one of my favorite roles on the group was don't piss off the admin. And I think everyone needs to have that as a rule in their group. I also have it in my, uh, my service dog group, my how to train your service dog, the Nipo Po Way Facebook group, um, because don't piss off the admin. And then that covers a lot of things, doesn't it? Uh, but yeah, so that was IACP. That was my doctor's appointment. That was my whole life medical history, um, which, you know, super fun for everybody to hear. But, you know, you guys share a lot with me. So I feel like sometimes I just need to share a lot with you right back. Um, and so you guys know where I'm coming from. Like, I know what it's like to want to do things and not be able to. I know what it's like to have doctors tell you that you're faking it. And that, haha, that's the reason why I rarely require a letter from a doctor saying that you need a service dog is because first doctors don't know what all a service dog can do. I've had people say, well, I have a letter from the doctor saying my dog's a service dog. I'm like, how oh, really? What test did your dog do for the doctor? Nothing. My doctor just said I really needed one. Um, Nicole says, hi. Hey, Nicole. 
Um, we missed you at conference. We hope you can come next year when it's in Florida. Um, Deb said, what about the harness issue? So this is something that happened in the Facebook group. So Boldly Design was there. Um, now Boldly Design has can the um, harness that we got from Carolyn for candy. And it's amazing. And I love it. Well, I brought it with me to conference because I figured I would try to, if I had time, I'd fit it while I was there and start gypsy on it. Because, you know, what better place to start training your dog on something brand new than at a conference with 500 of your closest friends? <laughs> um, but I figured if I needed tips, there'd be somebody there, you know, to do it. Because she had, so we, we had it. And when I saw Boldly Design this there, I said, hey, I have uh, one of the harnesses. Can you help me fit it? They said, sure. And I also asked them, I said, now, because Gypsy and I were both there. Gypsy is like 21 inches tall and I am 6'2". And I said, question, can she do, you know, like, what's your mobility thing? Because you see all these uh, infographics on Facebook floating around that the dog must be like 50% of your height and like 30% of your weight or something like that or more. Um, but everyone has their own little stupid thing. And my problem with that is, say somebody weighs 100 pounds, then their dog must be, what, 50 pounds, right? Which, okay, well, what if you get a dog who should be 30 pounds and you just, like, feed him Skittles and ice cream until he hits 50 pounds? Well, that's not what it's for, right? So I don't like that. And some dogs who are really big, out there and they'd be better off with, you know, a bigger golden or a bigger lab. Um, or you go with, you know, like technically I should probably have a Great Dane, a really big Great Dane. I don't want a Great Dane. Personally, I don't like drool and they're too big. Um, I like to fly. Well, I don't like to fly, but I don't like to drive more than I don't like to fly. So I fly and I think it'd be a pain to get a Great Dane in the spot. Um, they take up a lot of room. They bring a lot of attention. So like I like training them. I just don't want to own one. <laughs> um, so, you know, you have those type of issues. Well, Gypsy is small. Era was 24 inches. Like I said, she's 21. So that's three inches. That's a lot. So this is what they told me is if you have the flexible handle, not the semi-flex, not the rigid, if you have the flexible handle um, for what I want, uh, it doesn't matter how tall you are or how short the dog is, the flexible handle should be fine. Now, I'm not going to go out and get a chihuahua and do it. But Gypsy's also a tank. She's like 65 pounds and she's She's a brick house. So he said that was okay. So I thought that was great. Well, um, he went to fit it. The chest plate is too small. So I either need to order a bigger size chest plate or a different harness for Gypsy. Uh, and I'm thinking maybe just a bigger harness because if, if Candy has the one size, like I don't want to have to flip it back and forth. I think that would be annoying. <laughs> so is that more annoying than saving money? I don't know. Um, so yeah, talk to them. Karen had brought her yup harness, so brought it up. They said it was a, a quality leather, except for between the legs. And he's like, I don't know why they use quality leather everywhere else, because it's good leather, except for between the legs, but that's what they did. And <clears throat> they didn't have the triangle at the shoulder. They didn't have the triangle for that extra, um, like the belly strap that the boldly designed harnesses have. And he said, because of that, it's not going to um, distribute the weight and the pressure correctly. Um, so he said it's pretty, but um, usable on the dog and have the dog be good in the long term, not so much. Yikes, right? Um, the Yup Harness is like, none of them are cheap. Now, Boldly Design is the best and their price reflects that. Um, but Yup is, I'm going to say around 130, 150. And like I said, it's beautiful, but if it's going to hurt you know, Holstein, if it's going to hurt a dog, eek. Now, I also know people who make their own harnesses, you know, based on what somebody else is doing. Um, and it's usually the people who make them based off of what the Purple Poodle harness, you know, what they do there. And I don't know about that, but I do know uh, there's a girl who was in the group a year plus ago, and she made up her own equipment. And she said, I said, if you can get a vet approved, that would be fantastic, because I don't want to promote it unless it's vet approved. So she takes it to her vet and he's like, yeah, it looks fine. That's not what I meant. I wanted actual vet. So then she started saying that the whole, because it was Blue Pearl, it was one of the Blue Pearl vets. The Blue Pearl approved her harness. I'm like, oh, you're going to get into legal trouble with that one. Blue Pearl did not approve your harness. Um, you know, even if it was the best harness in the world, like one vet who works there doesn't mean, like if you go to McDonald's and you talk to one employee 
and you say, I like Pepsi better than Coke, right? And they're like, yeah, I agree with you. Oh, McDonald's says Pepsi's better than Coke. You know, it doesn't work that way. So, um, so yeah, on, on the online co- on the Facebook group, we talk, uh, we talked about it and she talked about what they said. So we, I like my boldly design. Um, you have purple poodle, purple poodle, purple poodle guide harness for Doc and Rio. Uh, Nicole, can you, when you have time, because I know you have so much free time, could you get some nice pictures um, at their level of the front and the side showing where everything hits for the purple poodle? Because I have a plan and um, I go, Karen and I go in like three weeks to go see Marina Ozuna, who does a lot with the body work um, and body structure of dogs. So I'm so excited to learn because this is one of my areas that I'm lacking in. And when I'm lacking in areas, I like to go to professionals and get help. And Marina is, Marina and Tawny are the ones to go to. So I'm doing Marina's uh, because it's in North Carolina and it worked out really good with my schedule and with Karen's schedule. So I'm going to be there and I want to show her some of these pictures and, and see what works. Even if it's not there, even if I send them home with her or I, I email them to her. Because uh, I did ask her yesterday and, oh, excuse me, guys. Uh, just burped. <laughs> um, I asked her about Boldly Design, uh, Yop, Bridgeport, and Purple Poodle. And she said she found another one, and she's trying that out. And they're in West Palm Beach. So um, Karen, actually, I, I shared that with her yesterday, and she talked to them um, about it. And it's a different looking design than anything else I've seen. They were making marinas today, and hopefully they'll get it shipped up today or tomorrow. Uh, so hopefully Marina will have it for at least a week or so before the workshop and we can find out how it's been working for her um, because I want to use the best for the dogs that enables them to do what they need to do. And really, because I've had some people like, ha, 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 boldly designs four to $500. But when you're talking about the health and safety of your, how many thousands of dollars have you invested in your service dog so far? You know, what's another $200, $300 to get the right equipment, the right gear that's going to last forever. And one of the good things, and she might come back and say, boldly design's terrible. I don't know. I hope not. Um, but, and again, it's going to depend on the dog and the build of the dog as well. So like what's going to perfectly fit my Doberman candy might not fit, um, you know, Gypsy, my golden. It might not fit, um, you know, Jen has a Roddy. might not fit that. You know, so like I know it's going to have to be um, dependent, but if we can have some that we recommend that we know are good, it'd be really nice. So Nicole said she doesn't like the Bridgeport Guide harness at all. Do you have it? Do you own it? Um, Nicole, because if you own the Bridgeport Guide, if you could do pictures with that too, that'd be super because I'm going to get the harness on candy and fit it back to her so I can show it to Marina as well. And, um, and just like I said, get her opinion on everything because I really, really value. I love her. She's super. Um, Thank you. She's going to try to take pictures. Pictures this weekend. Uh, so that takes care of my purple poodle one. I have a not purple poodle one. And I have the, I have a Bridgeport one, but it's it's from my Siberian Husky years ago. And I have the boldly design, so I can do pictures of those on candy. Possibly on Gypsy, but for sure on candy. Because um, just fit wise, I know they'll fit candy. Gypsy's my little chunk of monk. Uh, but that, that was our... Our, our time um, on the flight back. Oh, I didn't tell you this one. So on the flight back, Karen sat in bulkhead and Rich and I sat behind her because you can't move the arms up in bulkhead and I wanted to move the arms up so I could like lay on Rich if I wanted to <laughs> stretch out a little bit more. So a gypsy can tuck underneath that really well. And there was still, cause it was Southwest, there was still a lot of um, space between your knees in the, um, in the seat in front of you. And then Luke sat on the other side of the plane, like two rows back, which is where he had sat on the flight um, out there. So we're, we get in there first and, and we down the dogs and, and they're doing fine. And all these people are loading in and all oh, these kids pass Holstein. And it was so funny. Uh, you know, he's just like, whatever. And, uh, and then he's looking out the window for some of the flight. And that's what the picture is for this um, on Facebook was, was Holstein looking out the window. It's just the cutest picture. Like, he's just like, what are we doing? I'm looking out the window. I love him. He's so good. Uh, so, yeah, so so we did that. And we're flying. And I, I try not to eat or drink too much beforehand because I don't like to use the bathrooms on the plane with the service dog. Now, traveling with Rich, Luke, and Karen, it's not a big deal because I can just give it to one of them. 
But once it was just me and Aaron traveling and I downed him and I handed the leash to a flight attendant so I could pop in the bathroom real quick. Um, sometimes you're supposed to give it to like your neighbor person. I mean, Aaron would have been fine in a downstay the whole time. So it really didn't matter. Um, so I, I had to go to the bathroom and now I'm in the second row from the front. There's one front bathroom and two back bathrooms. I don't want to walk the whole way back. Like I said, I hadn't been doing well the whole week. I wasn't doing well there. I don't want to walk the whole way back and pee and walk up. So I'm like, I'll just wait for the person to be done in the bathroom. And Rich was at the aisle seat at this time. And I was at the window seat. So, and there was no one between us. So I said, when the person leaves, stand up and block so I can get out and use the bathroom because I really have to pee really bad. So he's like, okay, well, the person takes forever. And I'm like crossing my legs and doing the pee pee dance. And she comes out and she sees Holstein who's the row in front of us and blocking my way to get to the bathroom. And she just stops and she's talking to Holstein and talking to Karen and Karen's just like, Oh my goodness. Um, you know, and then the woman's talking to the person beside Karen and like, she's not moving. So Rich gets up, I get up, I hand him Gypsy's leash and he said um, he was going to sit by the window and I can sit in the aisle. And I said, no, that's fine. So, so he gets up, he gets back in. I'm still standing there and she's still there talking. And now she's like, well, you guys are blocking my way. And I'm like, uh-huh. So I stepped into the other bulkhead so she could walk by, but I'm like, holy cow. So that's one of the problems with service dogs. So sometimes people really have to pee and the service dog uh, person who talks to them just blocks up everything. But uh, but the dogs did absolutely amazing. Uh, I love that Holstein got to look out the window because it was, what, what time was our flight? At like 6.55 a.m. And we landed here at like 12.30 p.m. Um, they were just, they were excellent. Uh, now one gross thing, you want to know a really gross thing, even a worse story than me talking about my pee um, or having to pee really bad on a plane is when we got to Denver Friday night at say, I think around 10 30 is when we landed. And when, if we left at, uh, what time did we go by there? Like probably four in the morning, four 30 in the morning, they have a um, dog potty area in the Denver airport. And I think we were in terminal C there's a dog potty room. It stunk to high heaven. Like they need a gallon of Odo band there or more because it was so disgusting. Rich went and took her in whenever we first got there. And I thought he was just making up stories. I'm like, it can't be that bad. So I go in and on the way out and it was so bad. Like your eyes start watering and you're like, there's no way. And you know how much more sensitive the dog's noses are than ours. And what if you have a dog who relies on that nose for diabetic alert? brain alert, alert, cardiac alert. And here you are killing the nose, you know, to try to get them to pee. Um, so that was gross. So please Denver airport, clean the service dog bathroom area with Odoban. And for the love of God, take that smell away. It was terrible. Um, Orlando airport. Once you get past TSA, there's no dog potty areas. It's just outside when you're first entering crap, what do you do? Especially our flight there was delayed an hour. So we asked um, the flight people, not the stewardesses because they weren't there, like the flight people um, for the airline and they had somebody come and walk because I couldn't walk it. I was in a wheelchair on the way there. I walked out on the way back because I just, I needed to walk some. But um, Rich had Gypsy and Karen had Holstein and they took them outside the staircase, which is good I didn't go, see? And took him down and, and had him pee basically on the tarmac, I think. I think there's a little grassy area. But, like, they could see planes taken off and, and landing and everything. So, yeah, that's – I was like, that was – that was weird. But uh, they asked numerous times if the dogs were service dogs or emotional support dogs or pets. And they were told numerous times that they were service dogs. So they let them, um, they were under the impression, and I think they were actually told that if they were only ESAs or only pets, that they would not be allowed to do that, which to me is weird. But I guess since ESAs and pets don't have any baseline of training, yeah, I mean, neither do service dogs technically, but still. Dog relief areas in DIA are horrible. It was terrible. Like we've flown, where all have I flown? I've gone Maine. D.C., every, Colorado, California, um, St. Louis, Arizona, Chicago. I don't think I had a dog in Chicago. 
but I've gone different places with my service dog. And this was by far the worst bathroom ever. St. Louis was really nice, but this one was terrible in Denver. Oh my God. Uh, here Nicole says, I have one from um, Bridgeport. You like their handle, but you don't like the purple poodle handle. So use the Bridgeport handle with the purple poodle harness. And you also have a Gila Sun guide harness. It's nice also. Yeah, that's awesome, Nicole. Yeah, if you can do pictures of all those when you have time, I would appreciate it. Um, I don't see Marina for a while. I figure I could always send her. And hopefully with the course, I will learn more too, which is good. Uh, there's a whole bunch of books that she had recommended getting. So, uh, so we got them all. And I need to start doing that. That's my homework. So yay. Yay for homework. Um, do you guys have any questions for me about my health, my doctor visit, IACP or harnesses? Because that is what we talked about tonight. And I had to jot it down because tomorrow, when I do the pot, whenever I upload it to the podcast, if I do it tomorrow, if I don't do it tonight, um, I know what to title it and what to say. This is what we talked about. One of the things we're going to talk about, um, let me pull it up here so I can tell you. I have it under my to-dos. Okay, here's what the doctor said. Four grams a day of salt, spanks from knee to tummy, exercise, the pull and kick, a recumbent bike, or rowing machine, meds, and then the diet change. So those are the five things. I did cover all that with you. That's good. We're going to do a podcast on crate training. We're going to do a whole podcast for you guys on crate training and a whole podcast on starting a service puppy. Okay? Because I've had requests for those. And then, like I said, I want to get Tracy on for a podcast. So let me write that down. Tracy, I want to get Marina on if she'll do it for me. Um, Terry says, send me your doctor if I may need to drive down there and see him. It is, I will do that, Terry. It is Dr. Trevino. Trevino.com. T-R-E-V-I-N-O. <coughs> he also does telemed. So he will do it over the phone, well, over video phone. So um, they asked if we want to do, he said, "How? where do you live? And I told him Sumterville. I said, it's south of the villages near where the turnpike and I-75 split. And uh, he says, how far is it from here? And I said, about an hour 45. And, and they said, well, do you want the next one to be an in-person or a video call? And I was thinking about it afterwards because I said, I'm not sure yet. Can I decide later? And they said, sure. But I think we're going to switch and do a video call because it would just be a lot easier because that will save me an hour 45 there and an hour 45 back plus any traffic. But, well, I mean, with the new diet, I'm not supposed to be eating Chewies anyway, but we stopped at Chewies because I liked Chewies and it was in Gainesville and we don't, there's none really around here. He does accept insurance. He does not accept my insurance. Now he accepts Florida Blue, but like I guess my plan, he's not on it. So you have to pay cash. And so I'll PM you too with, um, with what that was, the first visit, and then the other ones are different prices. Um, so, yeah, but it worked. You know, I was glad that um, that he he's worked, I think it said like over 300 patients. So, and he goes to all the um, autonomic dysfunction things that they have. So he knows his stuff. And it was nice because he did. And Nicole says, do you have a podcast on how to pick a service dog trainer, what to look for, and how to avoid getting scammed? You know what, Nicole? That is a really good one to do. And I do not have that on my list, but I will. Let me grab Terry uh, for her PM so I can cut and paste that. And then I'm going to cut and paste this um, from Nicole into my thing. So if you guys have any suggestions, now is the time to do them. Oh, I came up with a picture of your border collie when I cut and pasted that, Nicole. Here, podcast on how to pick a service or trainer, what to look for, and how to avoid getting scammed. That's perfect. And you know what? Some of them can be shorter podcasts where I don't go on and on and on about things. <laughs> and that's perfect. There we go. Uh, but yeah, let me know what you guys want to see, what you guys want to hear. And I will catch up with you next week. In the meantime, check out learn.dreamk9.com. That's L-E-A-R-N dot D-R-E-A-M, letter K, number nine, dot com. Check out dreamk9.com. That's our website. The first one's our online school. Check out Dream Dog Central Florida Dog Training on Facebook because we're pretty awesome. And check out How to Train Your Service Dog Discussion Group because that is our public discussion group on all 
Clay Service Dog. We have that. And then we also have a private one for people who are enrolled in our online course for the service dogs. So we've got both. We're up there. We know what we're doing. We're also on Instagram under uh, Dream Dogs, Gypsy Rose Service Dog with underscores between each word. Uh, Candy Service Dog and Django Service Dog and Roma Service Dog. All four of them have their own Instagram accounts. And uh, there's a couple others too that we do. But those are the good ones. Okay. So I will see you guys next week. And I hope you do awesome. Until then, uh, like, like, rate, share, subscribe um, to the podcast. If you are listening to it via podcast, <coughs> like our Facebook, and then say you want to get updates, and then you'll know when we go live, because sometimes we do impromptu lives, and it's really fun. See you there.